guys. Let's get Mr. Anius' take on Season 3, Episode 7 about Subaru's defining moment and Al's secrets explained. Let's get it. Subaru's speech might have been the best bit of dialogue we've gotten since Rem's back in Episode 18. <laughs> Just like how hers was an emotional roller coaster of ups and downs, so too did Subaru fluctuate between courage and weakness. Yeah, I mean, in the first half, I was... Kind of like, uh-oh, this is very Doomer. He's going to just make everyone depressed. But if you think about how he he basically, he doesn't build them up. He like, he just like uh, hits rock bottom by having them feel the same emotions that like an average person could have, but then inspires them. And then the relatability factor that this average person is now, you know, inspiring everybody. I think that relatability definitely is the building up part. It was the culmination of his entire development into one 10 minute speech. It may not have been the same level of hope and despair we got with Rem, but the sentiment being expressed was very much similar. He had spilled his heart to relate to his audience the best way he could, then forced them to come face to face with the problem that they were hiding from. Yes, sir. That's the core essence of what Subaru was conveying, but if you want to know how exactly the people went to perceive it, that's what we're going to talk about here. The people should have then all ran outside and <laughs> say, Woo, let's go, let's free Pristella, and then they all get just massacred. That and the various secrets about Al that were and weren't in the anime. While the anime did give us one massive hint on screen, <laughs> there were quite a few left behind in the novel. It's super. Several telling interactions that reinforce the number one theory I'm sure a lot of us are considering. There was even a bombshell dropped in the break time miniseries, which I'll talk about as well. Yep. So, if you want to see that or the full effect of Subaru's speech, then stick around since we've got a lot to cover. But first, before we get started, I'm just going to take a quick second to. Oh, you got me. You got it. That's a new ad read, but I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. Jump over to Freer and first, though, because today's what is sponsors it? Starboard Systems. Oh, shit! Bald Man's Company, which actually. Asmin's really not really on Star Forge anymore because, you know. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, hey, here's a link though. Starforge.com. Any news. Y'all want a pre-built PC? Y'all got some money to drop? Frostic will help any news out. Episode 57. The newest hero and the oldest hero. Covering chapter 3 from volume 18 of the light novel. I'm gonna start with when Subaru first meets with Anastasia because there were quite a few chunks of context missing that explained more of the City Hall situation. More specifically, Lust's victims didn't just magically disappear and neither did the Black Dragon either. Where'd he go? As it turns Garfield out, stepdad. Anastasia had actually been able to gather them all together. She had figured out how to communicate with the dragon carrying Krush, then used said breakthrough to escort Capella's victims to a different room. Okay. It seemed the flies still had their consciousness, so that made them willing to follow directions. Okay, this, they're all listening. This, however, brought up a whole separate problem, because no one could tell if changing into flies changed their very sense of self, too. What I mean is, did Capella's transformation leave them as human on the inside, or I don't did know. it go so far as to transform their perception of themselves as well? That's the thing that I was talking about on, like, could you love a worm? Like, could you love me if I was a worm? Well, your physical, you know, makeup has changed, but what's inside the soul? If I was also a worm and we were both, you know, the same people that loved each other, then I bet we could. But, like, inside, are they the same? Or are they just insects? Whatever the answer to that may be, it was at the very least fortunate that the flies wouldn't be able to kill themselves. Okay. Since they still didn't know how to use their bodies yet, Anastasia could rest easy knowing she might still be able to save them. That's so I fucked mean, up. I mean, she was after all a firm believer of fighting till the very end. This was a desperate view on life that Subaru fully agreed with too, since to both, Straight so bet. long as life remained, there would always be a chance to fight back. Hey, that's kind of like, you know, Roswell's speech. I forget how it all started, but he was like on the bed and there's like, as long as there is life, there's like hope and there's, I forget how it went. What's the Roswell speech? Roswell Mathers season two speech, right? What was it? Fuck, surely it has, there's something here. It was something about like, as long as there's life, there's hope. And if there's hope, there's chance. And if there's chance, there's something. And if there's life, then, you know, we can save everything. I forget. It's, it's something like that. I butchered it. So, all in all, Anastasia had managed to take care of things without anyone getting hurt. It meant there was still hope to continue fighting. Now, Subaru's return gave Anastasia quite a bit of relief because it meant Garfield could finally calm down now. Ever since he saw Subaru fall into the water, 
He'd been running all over, checking shelters. That's right, Garfield did see that. Barely stopping to take any breaks at all. This was definitely risky considering who was out there, but with Anastasia telling him to come back every hour, she knew Subaru would be able to reconnect with him shortly. It was when Subaru went on to discuss Beatrice next that his statement about not hiding things seemed to trigger something. The way he mentioned how secrets wouldn't help anyone provoked a nervous reaction that made Anastasia seem like she was hiding something. Yes, she's 100% hiding something. I still believe that she knew the Archbishops would attack before. How? Massive networking? Secret agents within the cult? Some informants? Does she have future sight? Something like, I don't know, the, uh, the gospel? What's, what's she got? Before Subaru could probe her on what that was, though, she quickly dismissed whatever it was she was thinking about, then refocused hmm. her resolve towards dealing Sus. with the archbishops attacking the city. She was filled with rage from the events that transpired just before this. It also didn't help that she felt responsible for everyone else, since she was, after all, the one that brought everyone to Pristella. That being the case, for her honored guests to get so injured under her invitation, well, that was That's a humiliation she wasn't willing to take. She was now ready to fight with everything she could get her hands on, okay. only worried about the excuses for losing when she was dead. Such determination was actually quite the sight to behold, and for Subaru, he had no problem standing behind it wholeheartedly. So, the map in front of him may not have shown the people he was fighting for, but by simply closing his eyes, he could envision all the people he wanted to save. Every single one of them was someone who was precious to him. That didn't change the grim situation those people were facing, though, since, as they spoke, the townspeople were being pulled into a downward spiral of despair. Sirius's authority, combined with the psychological effects of Capella's broadcast, created together the worst possible duet imaginable. That's right, her voice was very, now, very, like, intimidating. It good for the resistance to rush to each shelter and mitigate as much damage as possible. Now, this was where Subaru needed to set the line, since while Anastasia was okay making sacrifices, Subaru made it clear that he wasn't. Anyone who didn't have the resolve to fight on the battlefield the witch cult forced upon them was someone Subaru believed needed to be fought for. Yes, and the best part is how Crunchyroll subs, I think they said, like, are you doubting the resolve of these innocent civilians as if to suggest that they should all, like, sacrifice themselves? If he started accepting innocence as part of the battlefield too, then that would make him no different from the witch cultists who started this. So that was the type of knight Subaru strived to be. He wanted to fight for those who couldn't fight for themselves. This was when Al would make his entrance, not only bringing news of Amelia's message, but also immediately attacking Subaru's heroic delusion. Yeah, heroic delusion is a very specific term that was used in this show, right? And I think, like, the whole attacking part comes from a place of, good, like, like he, he has good intentions. And I still, maybe I'm walking too back, and I think I'm way too fixed on the theory that, like, Al is Subaru from a different timeline, which is definitely going to limit the theory crafting. But if we build on that still, it could make sense that in a different timeline, Al fucked up and, you know, the hero delusions led to the downfall of that timeline, and he's trying to prevent this one to, you know, he's trying to prevent it in this one. That, that's kind of the feeling that I had. It's a very common trope with, you know, time travel and different characters and, you know, same characters coming from different timelines. But is Tape so corny that he would stick with such a simple, I don't know, cliche? Could be someone else entirely, but the Subaru connections, it just keeps on going. That's right. Even before Subaru had decided to give the speech, Al still believed Subaru's ideals to be nothing more than infectious self-satisfaction. Hmm. Garfield would then come in right- But infectious self-satisfaction, if at the end of the day results in everyone, you know, everyone being saved, is that a bad thing? Why is- because like maybe infectious self-satisfaction in the future could le lead to even worse shit? Like the whole thing was, this isn't you taking an L anymore, it's everyone around you also taking an L with you because of your heroic delusion. But that's something we've been doing since the beginning of ReZero due to the nature of Turn by Death. At that point, I'm thinking, how the hell, I mean, one of the things that made me think that maybe Al could have had a power similar to Return by Death was the notion that the Pristilla 10 were wiped out most likely by Al, just like how the floodgates were most likely opened by Al. 
before the first broadcast even happened, hinting that like you need some knowledge of the future shit because you didn't even know like before Pro Capella even did it. Now that cut content, maybe I misinterpreted it and I'm going off on a random tangent, but that's kind of why I thought Al could have had a power similar to Return by Death, but now in this one, since Al like proposes that heroic delusion thing and you know everyone else taking else, if he knew that Subaru, this Subaru also had Return by Death, then like it's like a very common thing. So I feel like Al probably has an authority, but his powers, I'm not so sure anymore. And there was the um, there was a one line, there was one line in the intro section of the episode where Al took out all the uh, witch cult members. And there was also a wheel there, like a steering wheel, which I thought was, someone said that like, hey, could this be like opening the, the dams or, you know, lifting the floodgates? Maybe. Um, but he also said something very peculiar where he's like, this isn't the way I was told it would happen. Something like that. Which is, huh. So he's receiving instructions. Does he have a gospel? Does he have something like that too, where he's listening to instructions from? Behind Al, but not out of pure coincidence like how you may have thought. Before I clarify that though, to give more context on Garfield's despair, he was dealing with the fact everyone he came with was either missing or unconscious. Remember he's like 14 or 15 at this point. It's the same stress Subaru was dealing with as well, except you gotta remember Garfield was supposed to be their guard. So as the last one standing when he was supposed to be protecting everyone, well, I'm sure you can imagine just how much guilt he was feeling. Now. Like all that shit before with Mimi too. All that stuff with, you know, um, Garfield's mom having new kids and having memory loss, like, like even before all this. And then the Reinhardt, you know, power um, insecurity, Elsa showing up, just teasing him. Like, he just continues to spiral towards more and more depression and darkness. Him and Al weren't on the greatest terms, so if not for the message Al said he had for Subaru, there was very little chance Garfield would have escorted him back here. As for how the two came across each other in the first place, well, that gets into all of Al's secrets that I want to talk about. Okay. So, to start with the peculiar circumstance which brought these two together, it all comes down to scent. After the flood had washed everything away, Smell. Garfield had started using his nose to track any scent he found to be similar to Subaru. Stop it. Oh, stop it, bro. What are you... <sighs> Garfield? can't smell the witch's miasma. I think this is something still a lot of people misunderstand. So like this isn't Garfield sm like smelling the witch's scent on Al and Subaru, even though they both have it. It's more akin to Garfield smells like, like, like it's like a dog smelling like their owner. I don't, I, maybe it's disrespectful comparison, but it's like, you know, you got a sniff inspection. You, you they kind of know what that smell is. You interact with other people and you come back home. They're like, they're like, what the, who the hell is that? It's that kind of smell. And if Al and Subaru are the same, ah shit, are they the same person? They could be somehow, like, instead of being identical from a different timeline, it could be like, I don't know, like twin brothers or like, <laughs> I want to believe that Al is Kenichi Natsuki. Yup, Subaru's Giga Chad dad from a different timeline. Why not? So, so, so I'm trying to go on, like, even though it may not be one to one, Subaru and Al, from different timelines, maybe like family, extended family, somehow. It was when he picked one up that seemed just like him that the person it would lead him to was Al. Yeah, there's also the other one where you could just say other worlders all smell the same, right? Where like that smell could be like, oh, it's, it's the sense that represents people from great, uh, beyond the great waterfall. This obviously could just be coincidence, but if we go back to when Al and Amelia were talking in the mirror too, so weird. something about the fact it was Al made her feel weirdly confident. Yes, and the speech pattern. Maybe I'm crazy, because again, I'm trying to walk backwards from this theory that I have, which makes me tunnel vision. But like, it's uncanny how similar Al sounded like Subaru during that call with Amelia. And then Amelia getting hyped up. That's something Subaru can do. Isn't that weird? There was this strange certainty that came with knowing Al was the one delivering her message. Almost like she knew he would be able to get it done for sure. Amelia wasn't sure why she felt so confident in his abilities, but after a little more thought, she realized something about him reminded her a whole lot about Subaru. Mm. Al's helmet here. Do you think that these uh, plus signs that also look like crosses, 
mean anything. Just looking at the design. Well, there is nine of them on left and right. So there's 18 of them. What does that tell me, though? I don't know. He's, he's part of the fucking witch's cult. Is, is each cross supposed to represent, like, someone important from the church that he's killed? Like, what is, what is that, bro? You know, like, rappers, they have, like, teardrop tattoos. And like, yo, what is that tattoo? It's just like, one for each person I've killed. Is, is, is it supposed to be the same thing for Al? Or is it just a random design? That was where those unexpected feelings of trust came from. So, with two people close to Subaru finding such peculiar connections, you'd think there was an interesting relationship between Subaru and Al then. Well, what pretty much solidifies it is the reveal Al gave during his short- Well, if you look at this helmet, now suddenly there isn't 18 anymore, and there is instead 12. Now this is a break time episode design, but the fact that they changed it here probably means this design doesn't fucking matter, okay? We're reaching. We are beyond reaching. In the extra break time episodes, this was actually cut content from season 1, but since his character is finally coming to the forefront, it was revealed Al is from Japan oh, too. Oh, back to 18! He had been isekai here over 19 years ago. Yeah. He never did figure out how it happened, but it's not like he was trying to figure it out either. He was too more busy so surviving. just surviving any way he could. So, Al being from Japan could be the reason why he shares a similar scent, or it could be something a little more complicated. I personally don't know myself, but I have seen a number of theories pertaining to Al's real identity. Mm -hmm. It's something we can only base off these clues and this one image for now. Everything just seems to point that they are the same person from a different timeline, right? But it feels too simple and it feels like a misdirection. And Tape is probably trolling us and it's going to be completely different. But uh, these comparisons, man. It's, it's too uncanny. Switching back to Amelia's message, despite Al's reason for obtaining it being flaky at best, it was clear Al wasn't going to reveal any more than that. So, as much as Subaru wanted to know more, he knew he was just going to have to leave it. This brings us now to the plan to use the media, and as much as it pained Anastasia to admit it, her choice to not do the speech was because she knew she wasn't good enough. She'd thought about it from every angle, and from that she was able to conclude she wasn't capable of bringing the hope Subaru wanted to bring. Okay. It was a decision that definitely didn't come easy. Pain indicated by her clenched fists and trembling body. When all those hopes proceeded to fall on Subaru, the only thing he felt was that this was a gross overestimation of his abilities. And I think that already kind of shows you the significant growth that Subaru's had. Because if you think about, like, the Subaru from the beginning of season one, I bet he would jump on that shit and just yap and say the dumbest shit and probably make a mistake. The self-reflection and the awareness that he's not good enough just kind of like shows in volumes how much aware he is and how much like he's been <laughs> not domesticated, but corrected from his past behaviors that's always ended in shitty situations. It was the same feeling he got whenever he talked to Wilhelm, Krusch, and Reinhard. Whenever they always spoke so highly of him, he couldn't help but feel that they were misunderstanding him. But you gotta realize, he looks like Jesus Christ to them though, right? Because this is a perfect timeline. Every one of these people just knows all of Subaru's dubs and has no clue of the L. Except, I guess, you know, crashing out at the royal selection. Remember when he did the whole stupid shit and Julius, you know, fixed him up? If you think about all the things that Subaru has always done, he's just at the right place, right times, knows everything. Of course, they're going to be looking up to him and thinking, please, give us another miracle. But to us, we know exactly what kind of hurdles it takes to get to that miracle. So Subaru is like, nah, you guys have no clue. I am not worthy, but all right, let's do it. You see, since to him they were all far more worthy of praise, the way they praised him just didn't make sense. They were much nobler people who he knew worked far harder than he ever did. So, the fact they still treated him like an equal deserving of respect, that tormented him since he personally felt he wasn't. And that is the significance of the white whale subjugation, right? This is such an incredible feat in Lugunica that's impacted so many people for centuries. And for him to show up and, you know, deliver them, I think it, like, it, it, it's why they respect him so much. 
It pained him to know that they all acknowledged him like that. He honestly felt that his real self could slip out at any moment, and it was when it did that he knew it would just end up disappointing everyone. Then, once the regrets came to light, that's when he knew they'd see just how helpless and pathetic he really was. This was what Subaru had always believed about himself. So, with such amazing people always adding to the weight of their expectations, Subaru believed one day he'd eventually be crushed by them. Hmm. Even so, he would continue to walk this path until he could no longer. It was the path of a boy who swore to be a single girl's hero, one that now had him becoming everyone's hero. The hero of the world. It was when Al had spoken up to contest that, that Garfield's reaction would lead to yet another interesting interaction. Okay. As soon as Al had Also, one thing to note here. <clears throat> Look at the scar on the arm. I read a comment that was like, that made me think like, holy shit. The scar on the arm, is this the same scars that Subaru had? Back in Arc 2, by the Olg arms? Like the hellhounds that bit him? Does anybody remember? Because like, someone said that, I'm like, wait, 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 wait. If that is true, then holy shit. Al really is someone like Subaru. It's a different place? But is, is the scar same though? Even if it's not the same limb, is the scar the same? Because I'm looking for parallels. Because like in a different timeline, it could have been the leg. It could have been wherever else. But the fact that those two scars are there, like, I I is it the same as what Subaru had? It's been a long time since I've seen that episode back in Arc 2. But if it's true, that's, that's kind of crazy. Touched Garfield's arm to let himself loose. Immediately, Garfield's expression changed for the worse. The thing is, Garfield himself didn't know why he reacted that way. It was as if Al had triggered some sort of instinctual response. Something that had caused Garfield to pull away reflexively. Because Al is also a big boss. Because <laughs> Al is Subaru. And Garfield is submitting subconsciously to this person who reminds him of Subaru? Is that what's going on? In any case, Al's point was that no one was taking into consideration Subaru's feelings. He was also very adamant about focusing on Amelia because Al seemed to know getting involved with the witch cult was a no-no. As if to speak from personal experience, he made it clear no matter what Subaru did, the witch cult would always come back to haunt him. They Personal experience, man. All of those different failures he probably experienced in a different timeline or a different time. Were words spoken in a way that made it seem like Al was clinging to something. Now. It's not like Subaru disagreed with this, but the thing about this situation was that the witch cult got involved with them. There was no choice to not be involved anymore. Since the witch cult was the ones who started this, Subaru knew he had to finish it. That's when Subaru would commit to giving the speech, but rather than show it from the perspective of several different parties, it was instead given from the perspective of Rat. Mm. We were first shown the crisis her and her brother had to deal with. It all started with the evacuation. Wrath. Perspective of Wrath. Y you meant to say, like, you know, the, the sister and brother of Garfield. Shown the crisis her and her brother. Also, another thing that it was in the back of my mind. Uh, Al's age. So he, he, um, Al was isekai about like when he was like 19, right? Oh, Raph is Raphael. Okay, I thought we're talking about like Wrath. My bad. And niece is right here. Um, I was talking about Al, and if you think about the timeline, Al got isekai 18, 19, and when he was like around 18 or 19, right? Or was he isekai 18 to 19 years ago? Because I'm trying to think, like, if he already landed in Wallachia 18 to 19 years ago, yeah, it's 19 years ago. It wasn't when he was 19, right? Because that, I think, will make it a little bit more flexible with the theory that Super is Al, or Al is Super from a different timeline, because, like, yeah, it, it, good, good, okay, good, good, good. If his age was already clear, then it would be very um, odd. Because, like, think about it. If he already got here to Wallachia when he was 19, remember, it's not 19, but just assuming it was, how does that make any sense that Al is Subaru from a different timeline? Well, maybe you could say Al got, I don't know, actually isekai into a different place three years prior, fucked all that shit up, then something happened, then he landed in Velaki at the age of 19, and then 19 years has passed. Maybe we can do mental gymnastics like that, but I'm just trying to think of, like, the timeline, his age, and, like, how much time must have he spent to, like, 
in a different timeline and then showed up in Valakia in this current timeline. Just like think, thinking about that. Brother had to deal with. It all started with the evacuation in the park, then quickly turned into a terrifying nightmare. You see, while at first there were voices that encouraged everyone to stay positive, eventually uneasiness took over and silence came with it. Soon after, people had stopped hiding their rage, and eventually the mood turned to aimless disagreement and annoyance. There was now a silent madness that was affecting everyone, one that spread from person to person like a wildfire. The flood was what pushed everyone over the edge, igniting the sparks which would send them into a frenzy of violence. The only reason it didn't escalate into a full-on purge is because Fred's tears convinced the adults otherwise. Oh? The moment they noticed this young boy crying, they immediately came back to their senses and knew better than to act out in front of a child like that. Fred Clutch? How long that would last was yet to be seen, but for now, it at least brought temporary peace. Okay, Fred, so I see you. So what likely happened in numerous shelters across the city was fortunately delayed by Fred. There was now a fragile equilibrium keeping things at bay. A brief respite only maintained by everyone keeping to themselves. Huh. I guess in the anime episode, obviously, we didn't get to understand that, but... There was a lot of focus on Fred and the siblings, like Raph, and how they started to get all, like, uh, hopeful, and everyone else also started to too. Since provocation was what sparked the last outburst, everyone felt the best thing to do was to stay apart and isolated. It was exactly what Sirius's power wanted them to do. Now, as soon as the people heard the media turn on, what everyone thought would result in the tipping point from no return instead turned out to be a voice unfamiliar to them. They weren't met by the same sinister voice they were expecting. Mm. No, instead they were met by statements quite the opposite. Subaru's initial words weren't meant to be unwavering or courageous because at first he wanted to convey the fact that he was just like them. Yes, and I think that's actually genius. In the beginning we were joking around saying, ah oh, shit, we're cooked. This is our guy giving the speech, we're cooked. But again, it's all about the relatability factor for the average person to portray these emotion and then be able to inspire them is way more than let's say like Reinhardt showed up and did a speech. For sure, you could definitely get hopeful in the same way, but not the same way. You could get hopeful, you could get inspired, but it wouldn't be the same because he's a fucking Giga Chat hero. Super is too, but Reinhardt is just like, he's not relatable. He's saying all this shit and you know, you Tatakai just keep fighting on. And maybe some people are like, oh shit, Reinhardt's there, we can hear do this. But I think that like, it's way more relatable if you can see yourself in that person talking. That being the case, in order to show he really did understand what everyone was feeling right now, Subaru was open and honest. He shared his insecurities and poured his heart out to them. This led everyone past the point of suspicion and disappointment and instead led them straight into confusion. They were unsure as to why such an apprehensive person was talking to them. Reason being that even if it was fake, what they knew they needed right now was hope. That being the case, <laughs> gave him despair. they couldn't help but wonder why such a seemingly hopeless person was talking to them. Well, with Let him cook. last words of doubt precisely describing what everyone was feeling, he had essentially drawn out the emotions that they were all hiding from. What I mean is that by describing the weakness currently eating away at them and spotlighting the cowardice currently plaguing their minds, Subaru was essentially forcing them to come face to face with the unresolvable reality in front of them. No one wanted to confront it head on like this, but Subaru was now making them do exactly that. So it was once those terrifying thoughts were at the forefront that that's when Subaru would turn things around. He would have the people look at the expressions of those closest to them, then have them compare such expressions to the ones they remembered. If for any reason they found such expressions to be unbearable, then that's what Subaru wanted everyone to rally behind. He wanted them to feel it wasn't acceptable to have such important people carry such pained feelings with them. And if the people they were looking at were hiding behind a smile, then it wasn't acceptable to have such feelings forced upon them either. No. To Subaru, the one most precious to him had a real smile far more beautiful than any forced one. There it is. So, with that being what Subaru was fighting for, he figured it was a good common ground that everyone else could get behind. A part of me wanted uh, Subaru to call out the Archbishops during the speech. Right? Just like how he was saying, like, I'll defeat them all. Like, it w and I, I know the Archbishops weren't even listening. And even if they were, they just don't even give a fuck. It would have been just, I don't know. <laughs> it's just, 
It, rather than just saying like, oh yes, we can do it, fight on. And then he's like, all right, I got some messages for you motherfuckers. Serious? You ugly as hell. Band-Aids. <laughs> Gluttony? Fuck you specifically for Rem. Uh, what else? Capella? You ain't even hot. <laughs> and finally, Regulus? That wedding? Just you wait, motherfucker. I'm coming for Amelia. And he just drops the mic and moves. I kind of expected him to make some kind of declaration for Amelia and to say that he's going to save her from like regular or some shit, but uh, nah, we're just going to stay focused. All the while, not once did his heart change from the weak, frail thing it was in the beginning. It's just now he was embracing such weakness and refusing to give up despite it. This was the core message Subaru was begging everyone to embrace as well. He wanted them to not give up, because even though they were weak and even though they were forced against a threat far more powerful than them, there was still something out there worth fighting for. So, as Subaru asked them if he was the only one, their cries to him fought against the fear nestled deep within them. Jigo! They felt they couldn't let the boy spilling his heart out stand alone. And you remember that, like, Subaru has no feedback. He has no understanding what the audiences are saying. So it's just, again, the memes of, like, super speech, but nobody listened. Super speech, but no one got inspired. Like, it, it, he just yapping and yapping. And, of course, to us, we see the reactions from others. But just, like, imagine from Subaru's perspective of, like, not having any feedback and just doing this. With his trembling voice, his meager encouragement, and his desperate plea, all of it resonated with their own shortcomings. It had made it so by standing up for him, they were also standing up for themselves, too. It was when Subaru finally stated that he'd fight and he'd win that not a single person doubted whether he would or not. With the way that he had spoken to them, they absolutely trusted in his ability to make that statement come true. But how? Do we have a plan? Because <laughs> that speech is like the same thing as Donald Trump showing up and saying, Listen, I understand the groceries are all fucked up, but I'll make it free. Okay, but how? Do we have a plan to like beat the Archbishops? Cause all we did was a bunch of hopeful yap. And if we can't deliver this shit. <laughs> yes, we have a semblance of a plan. <laughs> Good reference. <laughs> Donald Trump, do you have any actual like actionable items for the, you know, policies that you're saying? I have a semblance of a plan, okay? I, I got an idea. Just as how he trusted that they wouldn't give in to despair, everyone else believed he could pull out the victory. That's just how certain Subaru sounded here. So, when all was said and done, the whole speech was simply a boy who hid nothing from them. And I expect the checkpoint to be here. Because doing the speech all over again makes no sense to me, and it would be actually kind of funny as Subaru continues to die and loop and re return here, and he has to do a speech again. But every iteration, he's going to get just more... Just cynical and tired, and maybe the speech will be like, Alright, fuck you, I give up. <laughs> I don't know, but it, it's gotta be here, right? If there is a checkpoint, there's no way it's before the speech. It's gotta be after the speech. He had willingly hoisted everyone's hopes upon his shoulders, then swore to carry them to the end he knew they all wanted. Gaston, bro. Gaston, did you see that? Rachin. Everyone's hopes upon his shoulders. Pristella, then... sorry, Liliana is just a backpack. Yes. Or to carry them <clears throat> to the end. Gaston Giga. He knew they all wanted. Hein kills no there. No one knew what this boy even looked like, but at the very least, they could pray for his fortune. If he was going to be the hero they all imagined him to be, then it was the least they could do for someone who was just like them. An average person struggling against the impossible for someone he... Yeah, it does look like the Mushroom Head kid was directly involved with freeing Hein kill back there, right? Because, like... You, you saw the mushroom hair kid and Heinkel, you know, uh, freed from the ropes. The bottle was the one that, you know, I think, uh, who was it? Was it Felt? Somebody bottled Heinkel in the head, right? But if the mushroom hair kid is on the ground passed out and Heinkel's free, I feel like he, he fucked up. He deemed precious. But yeah, that was Subaru's speech and Al's secrets. As an episode that culminates all of Subaru's developments into one 10 minute speech, I gotta say, this is probably one of the best. Yeah, it's great. It's right up there with Rem's speech from episode 18. I'm curious to know what you guys thought about it too, so let me know down in the comments. I thought the speech was amazing. A lot of people are saying that, nah, this shit mid. Nah, 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 this is just a bunch of yapping. I think that, like, if you've been following ReZero from the beginning and 
haven't had all these different years of gaps and follow Subaru, you know, growth from the beginning like that, like I have, it's, it's just like so amazing, the development and the growth that you see. Even like before, where he thinks that he's not worthy to do the speech, already speaks volumes of the awareness and the growth that he has from the prior seasons. Um, regarding the, what was I going to say? Regarding Al, I, I would have loved Ennis to kind of talk about the steering wheel, what happened, you know, when, because it's so, it's, it's so peculiar how after Cristela got flooded, then, you know, Emilia and Al start having a conversation to the media. Al is also in a region where cult members are dead and he picks something up and there's also a wheel behind him, which kind of hints to me that Al definitely did flood Cristela. He then fought against the cult members. And then he picked up the media and then started to talk to Amelia. He most likely also killed the Pristilla 10 in order to keep silent of the secrets of where T-Phone's remnants are. Maybe Kiritaka's alive, but uh, I think the cut content confirmed that they're pretty much dead. Anyways, please go give this like. Link, Rem speech better than Super speech? Everyone has their own opinions on what's a better speech to them. Attack on Titan, Erwin's speech better. Yep, get mad.